What is going on guys? Welcome to the Wednesday Night Live Stream. And today we are talking about flow. And we have Mr. Nick Chen from Aquarium Cabinet Solutions on. How are you doing, Nick? Hey, I'm good. Hi everybody, how are you all doing? Long time no see. So how how's life in the aquarium install business going? Mm, good. Yeah? yeah, I've been busy. Been doing a few interesting projects. Uh one of note was Mr. Paul Williams when we went and delivered his system new system for himself. Nice. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I've, I've saw he showed a little bit on a couple of streams. It was looking pretty good, so nice. Yeah, he got his set up really quick as well. He had everything in tubs, and uh, he had all his transition planned out. So pretty much when we left, he went straight ahead and got everything in, and he hasn't had any yep. coral or fish losses. So yeah, he did a good job. Perfect. No time to waste. Um, so today I kind of want to talk about flow. It seems like it's one thing I tend to get a lot of questions about. And flow is questionably one of the most important things in the tank. Uh, arguably, like even like a lot of the BRSWC, like they their theory is it's more important than lighting. I mean, it, they're both up there because those are the two things are kind of like the main source of life for your coral. So definitely both up there. A um, couple of things. Uh, G Day Reefing, K Town, Brandon Smith, Robert Scott. What is going on, guys? Nasty Nemo. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the chat. Uh, what's going on, Rick? All right, so to start off, why do we care about flow? Why do we want flow in our reef tank? Uh, a couple of things. It is how your corals, it either is going to bring stuff to your corals or take it away. So if there's waste that your coral is producing, the only way it's going to get away from the coral is by the flow carrying it away. Um, same thing if it's trying to eat to get those little particles out of the water, flow is going to bring it to it. It's also all those little elements like your ions for your calcium, alkalinity, all that stuff is going to, the flows was going to help bring it to the coral. So it is kind of the lifeblood in a sense for most of the corals in your tank. So it's going to remove waste. It's going to promote gas exchange. It's going to bring it particles of food. Um, some corals too, when you see the little tentacles waving, the flows will kind of helps them catch particles that way for it. So there's tons of really big benefits to it. And another thing is too, a lot of people claim it will reduce algae to a certain extent. Like most people say cyano. If you have enough flow, it's not going to do it. I still debate that one, but there's lots of benefits to not having dead spots inside of your tank. What do you think, Nick? You concur? <laughs> <laughs> I just see you grinning in the background. <laughs> no, I think you're right. I mean, I mean, you know me well enough now, I think, Devin, that the thing with the reef is that... It, I mean, I know we're talking about flow this evening, mm -hmm. but it, it's always, for me, seen as part of the jigsaw. Mm -hmm. So what I like to call the rich tapestry of reefing. So it's a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, so I think tonight, um, I know primarily we're going to talk about flow, but in and around that, we also need to address things that the flow impacts on and also that impacts the flow, such as, mm -hmm. you know, your escape and things like that. And what you just touched on there with the sino if you if you can you know open up your scape mm -hmm. so that it minimizes the dead spots in conjunction with the correct flow in conjunction with the livestock that you want to keep because they're all the things that you, you're trying to mesh together mm -hmm. and that's why it's very difficult sometimes to just talk about one element yeah. of the hobby or, or reef keeping if you like without encompassing the rest of the stuff because it, 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 it has to work in synergy right yeah, it's 100% all related. And very good point on the scape, too. Um, your scape can make a huge difference on, you know, how many pumps you need, where you're directing your flow, what type of flow you want, necessarily. Um, more open's obviously better, because it's not going to be your pumps and flow hitting a big wall and kind of stopping there. Um, if you do have a very dense aquascape, that's usually a tank where you want to have a lot of different pumps in different areas to try and work all around it. Or if it's open, you know, you might be able to get water to flow all around and through it and prevent a bunch of issues that way. Now, there's also different types of flow. Um, one of the the old school pumps, I'm going to say, like the old school, it was basically just the constant on, right? You have your AC pumps, and it's just going blasting 100% all day, every day. Now, if you're running those type of pumps, one of the best things you can do is try and find ways to let the pumps intersect or bounce off walls and vary the flow. That way, you're not just blasting a coral with flow all day, every day. If you are doing that, sometimes it could affect, you know, the tissue on a certain spot if it's too much flow. Or if you get some really weird growth patterns too. I've seen some where like all the corals are like growing just arched over one way just because that's the flow is pushing that way 24 hours a day. 
Uh, it's le less of an issue now if a lot of the newer DC pumps can control it and pulse it and do all the random different modes. So that definitely helps out these days. But you do, I do still see some tanks with weird, really weird growth patterns from those AC pumps. Now, they, they do have certain ones like wave makers you can do with them, but I don't know. Per personally, I'm a big fan of the DC pumps now, just how much you can do with it. Now, another question that I get asked a lot is how much flow? Now, it's a big chunk of it. I don't think you can have too much flow as long as you're not seeing a negative impact from your coral. I think there's a lot of benefits to that. Now, this also partially depends on the type of coral that you have. So if you, like an SPS, for instance, like they can handle quite a bit of flow. Some of your softies, if you're blasting with too much flow, you can see a bit of a negative impact. Sometimes you'll see if flesh starts to recede or you're starting to blow some of the flesh off of the skeleton, then you know it's either too much flow or you need to find a relocate that you feel you had to a different spot in your tank. So a couple things to consider. Uh, Hank, need a VCA random flow generator. Yeah, so if you guys don't know what those are, those are a little 3D printed nozzle that you can... Put on the end of your return pump and it kind of randomizes the flow so random flow is a good thing you don't want to be hitting stuff the same flow all day every day so that's a big one how do you how do you find those nick you were working with the vca stuff in the uk yeah we imported them into the uk and um, just setting up helping to set up a, uh, a distribution in the uk for them so hopefully they'll get into a wider range of shops than, than the currently available and so that's really what I, my role i wanted it to be where mm. We got the random flow generators, uh, the awareness up for them and the demand to a point where a distributor would come in and take take them over. Cause mm -hmm. I just don't get the time to, unfortunately, to go up and down, you know, a huge amount of shops as as a as a authorized dealer would mm -hmm. distribute would. So yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, the product itself is is weird because when I saw the product and I approached Antonio. Uh, about becoming a distributor in the UK, it was a product I'd been searching for, mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't find. Um, up until then, probably the nearest product we had uh, to that would have been the uh, inductors, mm -hmm. and possibly um, Vertex had a, a product. I'm not sure if they still make it called the Vertex Motion. Mm -hmm. And basically what that was, was a motorized attachment that you uh, put your return pipe onto. And it basically oscillated left to right. Um, and you could set, it was digital, so you could set the speed of the oscillation and the range of the oscillation. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that was to produce that randomized flow pattern as, as best we could. Yep. Um, old school again, in the old days, we used to do things like uh, closed loop systems, especially on the big deep tanks, we used to do closed loop systems. And we mm -hmm. had... Uh, mechanisms that would spin opening and closing various outlets in in sequences mm -hmm. to create that you know on and off effect that you were talking about um but yeah i think the random flow generator product itself it, it manages to encompass all of that mm -hmm. um in a, just one simple nozzle yep um just touching on what you were saying about the the pumps and like especially like the static pumps which are just you on. Know, power on <laughs> mm -hmm. and no on off on off and things like that one of the things you can do if you if you do have those pumps or you want to use those pumps for a particular reason, you can get uh, switchable um, supplies for those. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple of companies that make uh, like uh, wave um, uh, supplies. So when you plug those on only pumps into them, the actual socket itself switches on and off. Mm -hmm. So then you still get that on and off pulsing mode. Yeah. Um, so that that again it that was an intermediary type product before we started getting the DC, you know, mm -hmm. built-in controller types that, that we have now. So, you know, they're, they're available for people if they still want to do it that way. Mm -hmm. No, good, good backup plan if that's what you have. Um, someone's just asking if you would recommend flow on both sides of a four foot tank. Personally, I would, I think it's, there's good benefit to having multiple power heads that helps keep more random, especially when the, the water flow currents collide or if they're turning on and off at different times, it kind of, Really makes it a little more chaotic and random inside the tank. Uh, C, C, what were they called? Sea squirrels or something like that? The ones that rotated the outlets back and forth? Sea squirrels. Yeah, sea squirrels. Yeah, I've never used yeah. one, but I've seen those on a few older tanks. Mm. I mean, um, see, my thing with flow as well is like, uh, I mean, I've just seen Cruz pop into the chat, so I'm hoping he's going to pop in the hangout if he's got time. Mm -hmm. um, now, I've been reefing like over 30 years. I've been in the trade 10 years of those 30 years, so... 
I'm old school, you know. I remember when we had under gravel filters and, and ocean rock and all that kind of stuff, and you were just trying to keep coral alive. You know, mm -hmm. never, never mind color it up and frag it and stuff like we do now. Um, and back in the day, uh, and I still see it to, to an extent now, the, the ideas behind Reefing was, uh, you know, when we had live rock introduced to us, that we fill our tanks up with live rock. Mm -hmm. And the more live rock, the better, because the more bacteria you've got. And then that then gave us the problem of um, entrapment. Mm -hmm. So the idea was like uh, direct your pumps at the rock to try and blow it through your rock work and it not to, you know, crud up. And then, you know, that will lead to, you know, uh, nitrite, nitrate and so on. And then you've got big nitrate spikes. So try and blow, blow your rock free from the buildup of crud. Mm -hmm. uh, get it out into your weir box and then into your sump and skimmer and everything else you've got in there. Um, so the old school principle was point your power heads at your rock. Mm -hmm. um, I was very much of up until, oh, I don't know, maybe eight, eight, nine months ago, um, very much of that same sort of principles and cre creating randomized um, flow. So several pumps, you know, four, five, six, seven power heads in, in a tank blowing in every which direction. So you didn't get these dead spots. Right. Mm -hmm. And then when I was speaking to Cruz, um, he basically turned around and said, oh, Nick, you're doing your, your flow wrong. Yeah. And I went, uh, okay. And he says, yeah, you're just doing it all wrong. And I was like, okay, then teach me. <laughs> and then basically what Cruz was saying is that um, what you want to try and achieve really is a momentum of flow. So rather than in the old days, we had these circular power heads that were blowing jets of, of water through the body of the water and mm -hmm. training, you know, uh, with that vortex motion, like in training the water around it mm -hmm. um, to, to go in that general direction. And then, like you say, have, if you imagine these almost like laser beams of flow crisscrossing around your tank, mm -hmm. that's essentially what we were doing. And what Cruz kind of explained to me is rather than do that, if you can get a momentum built up in your water. So if you see some of the early videos of um, the MP40s, for example, mm -hmm. that they were doing in the, the demonstration tanks were showing your water seesawing left and right. Yeah. So what I did was to, to try that out, I set up uh, one of my customer tanks with um, his power heads and we placed the power heads like a, th a th uh, sort of like a third to a quarter of the way down the water column and put them in a position where they were just blowing a, across the tank mm -hmm. directly, not aimed at any rock or anything like that. And we got that momentum building up where the whole tank was seesawing. Yep. Now what happened was that as the, the pulsing of the water started to generate that momentum, mm -hmm. the bottom two thirds of the tank picked up on that momentum. So the bottom uh, column of water was having the movement but not because something was pushing the water. Mm -hmm. It was falling into that momentum. So yep. the corals were swaying left mm -hmm. and right. And what, one of the first things we noticed was that because the momentum was entrained um, and the flow was being created that way, there was no pushing of water. So the corals themselves weren't getting back. You know, we mentioned earlier, if your coral starts stripping, your flow's too hard. Well, we found that we had quite a vigorous momentum going, but it wasn't, uh, there was no jet action going through the mm -hmm. water. So the corals were swaying in a very easy manner. And what mm -hmm. happened was the polyps were able to extend more fully because mm -hmm. they weren't getting battered. Mm -hmm. So we had as much sort of water movement as we did before, but we were less battering. Yep. And since I saw that, I started recommending it to other reefers. Mm -hmm. And they said the same thing. They had certain corals that, uh, especially with the LPS, where they got more extension on the, the polyps. And mm -hmm. the thing with that, if you think about it, if you can get your corals to extend more, then the light receptors on the on the coral itself is getting more light. It's mm -hmm. bigger. Yeah, And that's also true. It's, able to catch, it's able to catch more particles in the water. Mm -hmm. So if you've got mineralization floating around in the water, it's able to catch more of it. It's, a, it's got more uh, receptors in the... Uh, more little hands uh, out to grab all the particles. Itself. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's getting more of everything. And also light. Mm -hmm. You know, we know 
and corals about 80 percent of the food comes from light so the coral then is able to absorb more light mm -hmm. so all in all it sounds like it, you work in the opposite way because you're saying well slow down your flow to an extent to create that momentum let things expand and sh through the sheer um increase of the the surface area they're then able to get more nutrition more light more oxygen more of everything that it needs so if you give a coral more of what it needs I mean, it's going to be a healthier coral mm -hmm. no very true so that for me was a yeah that for me was a definitive point in in my own my sort of development if you like my own development in reefing uh, mm -hmm. through that one particular area which i thought i had it down because yeah. for years and years and years mm -hmm. you know we just followed everybody else and did yeah. it the way we've always done it so and then along comes cruise and tells me off you know <laughs> now a funny thing it's, it's interesting hearing you talk about it because that's what i used to do like with my last peninsula tank but right. my reason was that was the only way I can get flow to the far end without having a pump there was to literally rock the whole water column and get yeah, it this way. Right. So I was just doing it out of necessity because I didn't want any pumps cluttering up my peninsula end. <laughs> but yeah, it was interesting to hear the different methods about it. Now, yeah, what you're saying too with the, the la laser beams of flow back in the day. Mm -hmm. Now, at least for me, I'm a big fan of the pumps with very broad, wide flow. So you're not necessarily blasting anything, but you're still just pushing volumes of water. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the MP quarters really started that off with the wide, where it was in training flow uh, through the, the pushing of the water in, in a way where you've got these bigger, wider kind of um, uh, flow dynamics being created. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, I mean, at the moment, I would say my, my favorite uh, wave making type uh, pump would be the, the Jaya, mm -hmm. just because the lateral dimensions of it. So you can mm -hmm. really kind of get that, you know, that that linear push that you need to create that moment to get that momentum going. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think the the Max Bet Jaya is probably a, a pinnacle design mm -hmm. in, in the hobby. Definitely. Yep. There's certain products that come along in the hobby that change the game. You know, the game changes. And I would definitely say that the Max Bet Gyres are definitely a, chain, chain, uh, a game changer in the hobby, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and yeah, I love those pumps. I think they work really well. Uh, the fact that you can, you know, twist them, tilt them a little bit, you can change your baffles and down a little bit. So you mm -hmm. can really customize the, the, the flow pattern to get that sweet spot, the momentum. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, would you... When I, so I don't have, I've never used the Max Spect one, but I had the Jabo version. I did a mix of that in the right. B40s just to vary the different types of flow. Um, yeah. Which to me was actually a really good solution. Now I just have more of the Vortex on there, but I just like them because they're easy to clean. The, the gyres, yeah, yeah. my only complaint was they were a pain to take it apart and clean it and resemble it all the time. <laughs> yep. Uh, yeah, no, I agree. Mm -hmm. um, the, they can be tricky. Um, I think with the, the Vortex, again, for me, when I, tweak them on on customers tanks mm -hmm. to, to get the flow you know the, the way i do it now we just get a, you know depending on the dimensions of the tank obviously but again if it requires two two of those like mp4 is because the tank's quite deep front to back mm -hmm. then we'll put two equal you know sort of heights off the off the water yep. uh, column and then just in a you know one side by side kind of thing with a slight gap between so you're still kind of trying to get that linear sort of like push mm -hmm. yep and uh, then it's the timing between the pulse speed and the pulse strength that affects that yeah. momentum that you're trying to aim for. That's the difficult bit. It's tuning it. To you just got to keep tweaking until it'll eventually hit the other side of the tank and get that rocky motion once you find the sweet spot. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Uh, Cruz said the link wasn't working. Curses. Yeah, check your email again, Cruz. I did send it. Or possibly junk mail. Uh, question in the chat, Max Spect versus Ice Cap. So Ice Cap is just like a cheaper sub-brand of Max Spect. It's basically very similar pumps. You just don't get as many programming options in different wave modes with the Ice Cap. But aside from that, they're similar beasts. I think the Ice Cap's just the older generation of Max Spect, basically. DC pumps also don't pull oil and run your electricity bill. Yes, they're definitely much more friendlier than electricity bill. Uh, another one, just someone was asking about turning your pumps down at night. I used to do that. I don't bother anymore. I just let it go all the time. What's your thoughts? Do you play with your flow at night time? Uh, I think it's one of those things, to be honest, Deb. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, I think it's, I don't know what it is. Hobbies are very sentimental. 
you know, like in some things I don't necessarily agree with. And I think sometimes it's sentiment because it's a weird thing. Like it's almost like your reef's going to bed. <laughs> so it's going night, night. Yeah. So you took it in and make everything quiet and gentle. And so do you tuck your call. reef in at night? <laughs> you know, it took your corals in at night and give it a little coral teddy bear and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love my coral, you know. And it's, you know, I get it. And, you know, these are expensive animals and you want to mm. look after them and you, you think long and hard and you save your money and you research and, you, you know, you want to look after your animals, which is right. It's the mm. right thing to do. But then at the same time, I think the best thing I think we can ever do for for our tanks is emulate nature and, and, and use nature as much as possible. And again, mm. that's another cruise cruise that's his sort of philosophy as well mm -hmm. um so with that in mind is is like how much does the currents and the movement of water change in the reefs between you know day and night so um cur currents don't change but wind is generally calmer at night so it's generally less wave action so it depends yeah. on the type of flow yeah and also look at the corals as well like you've have you got deep water corals have you got midsection corals that you got you know mm -hmm high up near the tide type corals because that can make a difference as well mm -hmm. hey curious how are you doing hey doing fine finally got in excellent hey cuz <laughs> hey how are you doing nick mm -hmm. yeah good yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right so just to quickly introduce just in case i missed some so nick chan is in the uk and he's from aquarium cabinet solutions so he's been in the hobby for many years and does all types of aquarium setups and we also have crews on from elegance corals welcome cruise Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Greg's asking, who's responsible for turning down the flow in the ocean? That's Mother Nature. It's all her. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh, Al was asking, yeah. if you bubble scrub, do you need high flow since scrubbing can help corals expel waste? Okay. Um, well, the bubbles or the micro nano bubbles mm -hmm. um, actually enhance the flow. And uh, kind of along the same lines that Nick was uh, talking about, we used to utilize, you know, these huge return pumps because we didn't have wave makers mm -hmm. um, in our tanks. So we're trying to cause more flow, quote unquote, more flow in our tanks. Mm -hmm. But with the uh, with the event of uh, the introduction of the wave makers, the return pump should not uh, should have been uh, reduced in size, only allowing for, you know. A, allowable turnover mm -hmm. so with the enhancement of the bubbles or the bubble scrubbing um, especially at night it's kind of like uh, playing pool and i like to make a couple of analogies because a lot of these bubbles are so small mm -hmm. that you know it looks like smoke but at the same time it also has a mass and it also takes up x amount of volume and i'm sure uh, nick would agree and a lot of the other people that have actually experienced this is that not only does the nano bubble show the actual flow in the system, mm -hmm. but it also enhances. Um, and what I mean by enhances is that every water molecule will push against these really, really minuscule bubbles. And those bubbles push other water molecules out of their way. Mm -hmm. So what ends up happening is you have a billiard type situation where you have one bubble push water molecules and that one, that one bubble pushes multiple water molecules to get it out of the way thus increasing a lot of the localized flow. Um, really hard to explain, um, you know, without showing a model. Mm -hmm. um, but if you could imagine just, you know, the triangle of billiard balls, um, you know, on a pool table. Yep. And that one bubble is the cue ball and you shoot it at that group of uh, water molecules, it'll tend to scatter. That's the enhancement that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm is that one velocity, one bubble velocity mass will actually hit multiple uh, water molecules and get it to get out of its way. No, that's They're, actually, that's a good analogy. So that's a good way to think of it. And, and, and mm -hmm. that's very, very similar to the RFGs too, is that with the turbulence, you mm -hmm. have the, a stream of, I want to call it uh, a stream of water molecules at a mm -hmm. certain velocity. And then it, due to the irregular, you know, the arrangement of the water molecules will actually tend to alter the flow. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why when you see the RFG in action, you'll see a stream and then all of a sudden you'll see a torsion mm -hmm. in the stream of water and it'll twist it, 
causing the random flow. And uh, Antonio and I actually talked about this a couple of times, you know, very similar to, to Nick talking with him as well. And it's, it was one of those products, you know, even though it's static, you know, basically it's a fixed piece of plastic, the irregularities in the manufacturing of the nozzle allows for an, enough imperfection to cause a spin mm -hmm. on the water molecules or the stream of water molecules that's actually passing through it, depending on velocity. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a uh, very, very similar to the dimples on a golf ball. You see micro turbulence, um, yeah. you know, spinning around. And I'm sure that there's plenty of models of that out there. Mm -hmm. The only thing is, is that in the hobby, we tend to think about only the hobby and we don't apply physics to the hobby. <laughs> and the thing is that a lot of the physics is relational, mm -hmm. meaning that if it works in one application, that's totally separate from water, yeah. you're utilizing air, it will cause that lift. And that mm -hmm. lift in the RFGs will cause that turbulence. Same with the, uh, with the bubbles, when you actually introduce it into the stream, mm -hmm. the bubbles actually cause a turbulence. And it, you know, the irregularity in size, especially just utilizing a wooden air stone, and it's not all uniform, will also cause some turbulence. Mm -hmm. Therefore, enhancing the flow, you get a mix of micro bubbles, which you could actually see and you can see it all shiny and stuff like that. <laughs> and then you see the micro nanos, which are the white particles that you see floating around. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the people say, well, that's not nano bubbles because nano bubbles are invisible. But the thing is, is that in a enough of a density, enough population of those very, very, very small bubbles, you could actually see an opacity. Does that make sense? It's almost like a lens. Mm -hmm. You know, you know how you have the the foggy lens. If there's enough imperfection, you get that fogginess around if it. If you shine kind a, of like humidity droplets, a very bright flashlight or a laser beam, you can see all little specks through it at night. With it, correct, on. correct. Mm -hmm. um, now, a, se a minute ago, because before I forget about it, someone was asking mm -hmm. how we think the RFG or how well it works. Uh, with all the testing I've done, I find it's actually more effective the more flow or velocity you put through it. You get more. Mm -hmm bang for your buck out of it of actually randomizing it and in a question a minute ago annika was asking how much does wave generation affect gas exchange okay so surface tension is quite a bit actually mm -hmm. as you break this if you have a perfectly flat water surface there's and all your pumps are down low you're not going to have very much gas exchange but waves and all those ripples on the surface are going to essentially promote the gas exchange. So it's going to help release carbon dioxide and suck in oxygen. Oh, you know, assu can I, can assuming, I say <laughs> assuming your room has a lower thing. It's going to equalize the room around it, right? So it can only go to yep. a certain extent. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay. So um, you were talking about that flat plane surface, right? Yeah. Only that flat plane surface area, right? Length mm -hmm. time width. If you yeah. think of actually induce or the ripples an increase in surface area that mm -hmm. you've just created it's kind of like the inside of our lung mm -hmm. now you've created micro microwaves or small 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 waves with the ripples that now you've increased your surface area many times exponentially mm -hmm. so very very similar to our lungs you know even though it takes up a very very small area all the convolutions all mm -hmm. those little dips and peaks inside our, you know, the alveoli and stuff like that increases the surface area to where we, you know, our lungs could actually cover a football field, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and very, very similarly with the waves, as you cause that turbulence along the surface area, you've increased it from a flat plane, which has a fixed, fixed surface area for gas exchange. And mm -hmm. now you've induced ripples into that surface. And now you've increased your surface area, mm -hmm. you know, tenfold, if not a hundredfold. Yeah. No, that's a great point. That's one of the reasons why, yeah. yeah so that's one of the reasons why people, um, you know, increase that, uh, that surface rippling, as you call it. Mm -hmm. And they say that it's gas exchange, but they can't explain it. No, that's and actually... when we actually read... Yeah. That's the best Go analogy ahead. I've actually heard of it. So that's perfect. In, um, it just made me laugh because back <coughs> in the day when I used to be in a planted tanks and you're injecting CO2, mm -hmm. I purposely wanted my water smoother so there would be less gas exchange and hold the CO2 lower <laughs> mm -hmm. for the plants. <laughs> Absolutely. And not only that, but if you're actually talking about just water, you know, the movement of water as energy itself, mm -hmm. adding that extra kick of energy or that potential energy into the water 
actually drives off a lot of gas and degasses it, you know, degasses mm -hmm. excess gassing, uh, metabolic gases, so on and so forth, CO2. Um, you know, it forces it out of the water because it's no longer stable. So one of the reasons why when you shake up a can of soda, it wants to degas all that CO2 immediately. Mm -hmm. That yep. kinetic energy is enough to actually force gas out of water. So when people claim that you could oversaturate your water with, uh, with oxygen, it's very, very hard if you're at atmospheric pressure mm -hmm. because of all the turbulence, the circulation in our tanks. I mean, the only time that you could do that is underneath extreme amount of pressure, which is either from the, uh, I want to call it the return pump, mm -hmm. but in large aquarium systems, you have these huge, huge, you know, 400 horsepower motors that are pushing all that water. Yep. That, that cavitation, as well as a lot of that pressure in the head pressure going through those pipes can actually crush the uh, the gases down into the water column and then as soon as there's a pressure release or dp uh, differential pressure um significant enough to where it's released back to atmospheric pressure mm -hmm. that's when it starts foaming does mm -hmm. that make sense yeah and it starts fizzing out just like C um, the co2 in our in our carbonated drinks mm -hmm. hmm. so i mean with our technology in our household pumps we don't get that type of pressure Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. So it's not 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 a consideration for the average aquarist, basically, <laughs> unless you have Correct. a massive, massive giant system. So absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, we run across that same problem in wastewater water treatment plants, where we're utilizing these large blowers, we're utilizing these large circulation pumps. Mm -hmm. And that's the only time that we would actually get pressurized gas dissolving above saturation. Now but with the Jabos, yeah, with the Jabos and the smaller uh, aquarium size pumps. Yeah, so no. okay, n not an issue for the average home user, but is there Correct. any issues? Like, I don't think even atmospheric pressure. I don't think it'd be enough to be an issue unless you're injecting like pure oxygen or something like that. Like, I don't think atmosphere even could dissolve to a point that cause an issue that I could think of. Like, is there any scenario that you could think of that would? No, because there's still turbulence uh, coming from the overflow. Mm -hmm. So at that point, it's going to be degassing again. So if you have a higher concentration of oxygen, it's going to degas when it goes to the overflow and returns back to your sump. It'll, you know, there's enough turbulence. Once again, the shaking of the, the carbonated uh, can of uh, pop or soda, mm -hmm. you shake it up, it's going to want to explode, you know, and it's want to, it wants to get released from the water column. Yeah. One of the hardest things in, uh, I want to say, one of the hardest things in nature or in physics is to dissolve a gas that mm -hmm. is readily released from water. Yep. No, nope, I mean, true. you have, I mean, at, uh, you know, at Anheuser-Busch where I was working at over there at uh, PepsiCo and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you have to have it at a certain pressure in order to get it to dissolve into that sugary water because the sugar in itself will push off gas, just mm -hmm. like salt water. You yeah. add salt to, uh, to a can of pop once again, mm -hmm. all that mm -hmm. soda, all that gas would start wanting to come up. Hmm. So if you guys really, really want to try it, take a can of pop, seltzer water, whatever you want to, you know, whatever that's carbonated, put a pinch of salt in there and tell me whether or not it starts foaming. Interesting. I've never tried that. I'm going to try that later. <laughs> yep. yeah, absolutely. Well, yep. it's kind of like Mentos also. Mm -hmm. You drop in Mentos into a freaking uh, Coca-Cola bottle. There's exactly. It's going to yep. degas as fast as it can. Mm-hmm. Okay, now another, so speaking of return pumps, so sump turnover rates. I know back in the day, everyone wanted a ton and ton of turnover. And I think this was before we were relying on power heads for a good chunk of flow in our tank. Do you sure. think there is a big need for a crazy flow throughout the tank? Or sorry, through the sump? Do you think there's any benefit to super high flow or just moderate flow, low flow is good enough to deliver your heat exchange and your skimmer? Well, it's kind of, well in uh, in the industries that I work with, um, you know, either it be it biopharmaceutical or any other type of like heat exchanger or mm -hmm. anything else, you need you need what we call dwell time, especially when people are utilizing UV mm -hmm. or they're utilizing reactors. You can't just force water through it at such a high velocity that there's no exchange. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, a okay, if you have a titanium heater and I'm sure that everybody could relate to it. If the 
the high, yes, it's going to transfer heat, but mm -hmm. you're not going to get, uh, I want to say good contact time to actually mm -hmm. increase the heat. Um, over time, yes, it'll build up, but if you're talking about watt per watt energy, mm -hmm. you know, pure energy transfer, you're going to lose a lot of that heat to evaporation. Mm -hmm. So the lower your flow, the more dwell time to the uh, to the heater, the better the heat transfer rate to you know to that water. Mm -hmm. Once again, it's it's all relative to uh, to flow, and especially with the people that are running refugiums, you don't want such a high turnover rate because you also mm -hmm. want one lower flow for the um, I want to call it the macroalgae to be able yep. to absorb some of the nutrients and pull it mm -hmm. out of the water, and so if the particles or the nutrients that are dissolved in the water are flowing by too fast, what is the probability that it would be able to pull it out? Okay, so that's actually one question I was going to ask. Is it more efficient mm -hmm. to have it with a long dwell time versus passing by quickly? Like, does it balance out, or, or is it actually more uh, beneficial to have it slower and hanging out with the heaters longer, hang out with the skimmer so it filters that same chunk of water for more time than just little bits of... I, I, like, is there a difference, or does it all even out? I would... It, it typically evens out in what I would call a closed loop system, mm -hmm. but but the energy that you're putting in, I would say, is wasted to heat. Okay. Um, and watt per watt, you're not really accomplishing much more. Does that make sense? You're, you're pushing mm -hmm. water at such a high speed um, because you believe that it would cause more contact time with more of the water column. But kind of like what uh, what Nick was saying is, if you have constant motion in your main tank, the turnover is going to be a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. So do you really need the, you know, do you really need full 100% turbulence in your tank, you know, to the, to the point where the velocity of the water is starting to strip coral, causes your PE to shrink back into the coral? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's, I want to say it's wasted energy. Okay. And you're paying for it. You're paying for it with money. All right. So turnover from the whole system so in theory lower flow well one it takes less electricity and two mm -hmm. there's potential benefits of having more dwell time with your reactors your skimmers your heaters your chato all that type of stuff so lower flow actually has right. some benefits there to an extent right now too mm -hmm. low would be maybe if your heaters couldn't keep up it was exchanged enough but i think that any you know decent mm -hmm. pump is not really a big issue yeah, I don't think that would be an issue, to be honest. But the other thing as well, though, mm -hmm. think of it this way, because this is like recently in my reefing, I've started to connect more dots than I connected before, mm -hmm. just through development of different things and then going, ah, oh, so that means this, and then that now does that. And, you know, I didn't correlate it that way before. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, what Cruz is saying there, what you were saying was like, okay, so you kind of waste an electricity trying to generate this massive flow, but then by creating that massive flow, you're inhibiting the, the macroalgae from taking out the nutrients mm -hmm. and things like that. Remember what I was saying is that when you lower the flow speed or, or, or sort of like the velocity, if you like, mm -hmm. when you build the momentum. Yeah. Yeah. So bashing, sorry, in case instead of bashing your coral, you're mm -hmm. allowing the movement of the water to, to carry the coral backwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. um, what then happens is your coral polyps are, are massively extended, like we we're saying. So because they're massively extended, they're taking more things out of the water. Mm -hmm. So in the old days where we're thinking, increase your flow, why? Because we need to whip those particles up and then get them to somewhere they can be taken out. Mm -hmm. Actually, by if you've got a lot of, of coral, a lot of LPS, a lot of SPS in there, Lowering your flow means that their polyps can extend to feed from those particles mm -hmm. that you, so they're taking it out by eating it rather than you filtering it out. Yeah. Do you, do you see what I mean? So on the feeding thing, at least on my system, what I do, I turn my return pump off for an hour. Yeah. So it's off for an hour. So it keeps basically all the food particles in the tank and I have my power heads yeah. go into like a slow Twenty percent ish or whatever for about twenty minutes or so, and they kick back yeah. up to normal speed just to keep those particles floating around. To hopefully everything Suspended. catches it. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing as well is like remember what I was saying about the the pushing the the water, trying to push it through the rock. Mm -hmm. What you're also really doing is pushing the water into the rock and compacting 
you know, those that particulation, right? In, in you know, into the detritus and everything, so it's like compacting it into the, the nooks and crannies of the rock. By having your, your momentum of the water so it's going backwards and forwards, mm -hmm. it's not a it's not a, um, what's the word? It's it's not a continuous push, mm -hmm. you know, into the rock because it's going backwards and forwards, so it's going towards and then out, towards and then out. Mm -hmm. So that so again, like you were saying, it's keeping those uh, particulation in suspension more than rather than being pushed mm -hmm. deep into deep crevices of the rock. Yeah, you know. So that I I just find that in terms of feeding and what your coral and, and the fish are getting out of the food that's been available, they're able to get more out mm -hmm. of less. So you're, dare I say it, feeding your fish less physically in terms of putting stuff into the water. But what you do put in, they're able to get more of it. Mm -hmm. So so in the past, if we compensated by, you know, throwing food in the water and then, yeah, like you said, it goes backwards and forwards. Some of it goes, drifts away, and then it gets forced around and around and blown into the rocks. Mm -hmm. Are we actually able now by having that momentum of water, keeping things in suspension a lot longer, so more of it can be eaten, so therefore you don't need to feed as much physically because they're able to get more out of it more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Then it comes then back to the whole thing of less food put into the tank equals <laughs> less decomposition, which equals less ammonia, less nitrite, less nitrate. And to me, or for me, the, one of the main things that people do have to try and deal with is the nitrate, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can create less nitrate at the source without affecting you know, the, the health and well-being of the fish by, you know, lowering their food intake, their nutrient eat, intake, mm -hmm. then we're then able to control it better on the back end because we're dealing with less of it. Mm -hmm. So it's easier to deal with a little bit than with a lot. <laughs> yeah. All <laughs> right. prevention there from dealing with those issues in the first place. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the other thing for me that, again, when we mentioned at the beginning of the stream, it's difficult to talk about flow without talking about the rest of the tapestry of the reef and the aquascape for me mm -hmm. is a major point of getting it right at the very beginning because one of the first things we do before the fish before the coral before pretty much uh, adding your wave makers and stuff into the tank is you're going to scape mm -hmm. uh, and for me again the pinnacle point for me was when i thought hang on a minute i'm loading these tanks up with you know, a kilo of live rock for every 10 liters of water. So that gives me a calculation of how much live rock I must put in this tank. I started to think, why? Why do we use that calculation? Where does it come from? And the, the theory behind it was that the amount of bacteria available in that one kilo of rock will deal with the stock that you would ideally put in 10 liters of, per 10 liters of water. So mm -hmm. it balanced out. And I'm thinking, well, what if we don't trap waste in that rock mm -hmm. and it's allowed to be suspended in the water column and it gets either devoured or it goes into the weir and then out of the filters and exported uh, or into filter media which we've now got really good filter media available that then can act as like massively efficient live rock but in your sump then if i you know have less rock or if i hollow out my rock so there's less mass of it i'm decreasing the entrapment if i decrease the entrapment mm -hmm. then my tank doesn't become a biological filter impacted yeah, yep, yeah. Exactly. and there's no impacted uh detritus no impacted food and, and all the rest of it so my tank isn't the filter anymore my sump is my filter so then i'm getting less waste and build up in my display which then affects things like you were talking about before, cyano, you know, dino, all the other adverse stuff we get because that's feeding on excess trace waste. Mm -hmm. So okay. you can you can avoid all of those things by, mm -hmm. you know, having less rock. Yeah. So and like here, it's here. sustainable. You know, it's better environmentally, it's better sustainable, and all that as well. But it's easier on your pocket to have less rock. Yep. It's, a, it's a, you know, you're saving money on that side of the hobby, although you're going to spend it on fish and coral, I believe. But, um, and it just really makes you think about, you know, what you're doing and how that relates to other things that you're doing, like your flow and everything else. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so your question. So you're talking about stuff potentially being trapped in the rock. So mm -hmm. now if you have a good amount of flow, do you th think that it would prevent it from settling and getting compounded into the rock? Or do you think... No, I... no because if you think about it, when you look at live rock, uh, especially the dry live rock, so, mm -hmm. you know, there's, it's not uh, being camouflaged by algaes and chloration rocks. So when you've got the stuff that's been cleaned out, you can see that a lot of those little holes in those burrows don't go all the way through and then out the other end of the rock. Mm -hmm. They go partially into the rock and then stop dead, at like a dead end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So pockets. Yeah. So you're going to get pockets of, of uh, porosity within mm -hmm. there. So it, it, like Prue says, it, it gets compacted and like, You'll see, you'll hear of people that um, are just changing tanks. So they take the live rock out of one tank and they put it into the new system. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden they get elevated parameters because all the crude and built up uh, compacted stuff in there has now been yeah, disturbed I... by you lifting it out. So it's not clean. Right. It's, it's collecting and, it, and it's, it's dirty. Mm -hmm. So my idea is that the cleaner we can keep the rock mm -hmm. by having less entrapment, then the better it's going to be for your system because that entrapment has come from somewhere mm. and has to go somewhere. So, so if it's no longer in your rock, yep. where's it going to be? So it's the, going to be in your skimmer. It's so, going to be in your filter socks, right? So the best solution is to have all your rock fully encrusted in coral so there's no pores left open? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that discussion with a um, uh, long time ago mm. on a forum, and I was saying my, my choice of rock now would be the least porous rock available Mm. And the and the minimum amount of it that I could get away with, uh, because for me the rock only serves two purposes: one to give shelter and hidey holes and crevices for my fish's comfort. Mm -hmm. You know, because some fish are timid, some fish want at night they want to hide themselves away. So that's one purpose, and the other purpose is as um, coral placement. Mm -hmm. You know, to build mm -hmm. the structures that your corals need to get the right amount of light, the right type of, of, of flow in a yep. given area. So that's really for me now. That's the only purposes the rocks the rock mm -hmm. gives. So if I could get solid glass rock, you should in make the this. shapes I wanted it. You you've like been solid. Talk... You, sh you should make <laughs> some molds and melt some glass and make these. Yeah, but if I could get solid glass rock mm -hmm. that had zero porosity, mm -hmm. okay, but I could I could like you say mold it into a shape that I was able to build structures with that gave me the hidey holes and the, 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 the comfort zones for my fish and the coral placement I wanted. That for me would be the best rock you could buy because it's going to entrap zero. It's going to allow those particles to be in the water column to mm -hmm. be taken out to your sump. But yep. then in your sump, use the best filter media you can for mm -hmm. the bacteria that you want. Let that be your home for bacteria and not your display. Imagine how nice your display is going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. zero entrapment, zero generation of, of ammonia, nitrate, phosphates, nitrate, yeah. phosphates, mm -hmm. phosphates, all of that. It's not going to be yep. generated in your tank anymore because there's nowhere for it to be generated because there's, there's no entrapment. There's no compacting yep. of, of sediment anymore. It's only the food you put in. Only the food you put in, which again, any of that mm -hmm. that's left over is going to be blown around, blown around, and then poof. Yep. Mm -hmm. The only and place then... it could get entrapped is like, Coral and sand, the Rocky or coral sand. And sand. Yep. Yeah, I can't give yeah. up sand. I know there's a lot of people are going for the bare bottom trend, but I, I just like the look of it too much. Yeah, me yeah. too. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, the thing is that you know, uh, and I was just thinking about it when uh, when Nick was talking about the the whole turbulence, and uh, you were mentioning it as well, um, Devin. Mm -hmm. Was that in in hot tubs we have a lot of turbulence, right? All those jet heads and everything else, mm -hmm. but yet there's that one corner that that no matter how much turbulence you blow around, it always settles in a couple of corner pockets, mm -hmm. no matter how smooth it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of along the same lines, when, uh, when I was talking to Nick about water movement and pulse flow and getting that standing wave to actually move the entire water column, that, uh, I want to say that was an aha moment where you actually said, oh, so the turbulence doesn't really ensure and guarantee that there's no detritus buildup in any of the corner of your tanks, regardless of how many pumps or power heads you actually put in. 
-hmm. you could minimize it yes and you could try to blow it around but there's always going to be settling spots especially with high turbulence Mm -hmm. we experience that once again in our industry or in the wastewater industry yeah go ahead so if you had high turbulence and like random Mm -hmm. different pulsing and like the reef crest like all those different modes do you think that's mm-hmm. enough to break up these pockets? Or, I mean, you're still going to have them somewhere. But... No, yeah. because there's, if you go back mm-hmm. to physics, there's destructive there's and constructive yeah. wavelengths. Mm-hmm. And the destructive uh, wavelengths or the wave patterning uh, in that turbulent flow, there would always be dead spots. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you did pulse, your water column is moving, mm-hmm. you get near zero. Mm-hmm. Except around the rock work and where you're getting some, uh, what I call shadowing from the wave. Okay. Or now, from that waveform. So uh, one question I saw pop up a couple times in the chat when we were talking about Chato and dwell time and flow. Uh, mm-hmm. For Chato to, assuming the same water column, whether it tumbles or is just stationary, do you think there's any big differences in that one? I still see that one asked twice now. Mm, no, but I, I, I don't go out of my way to make it tumble. Mm-hmm. It's uh, typically a mat or surface type of plant. Mm-hmm. Um, or macroalgae that tends to float on the surface of the water. Um, that's where a lot of the uh, wild Cato is. You could see it's kind of like kelp too, you know, where you start seeing the layering just right on the top of the surface of the water. Mm-hmm. It's not tumbling. It's not, you know, it's just waving back and forth in, you know, in the current yep. or in the waveform. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the tumbling action, I think, is more aesthetically pleasing to some people. It's kind of mm-hmm. like a lava lamp really keeps you busy and keeps you entertained but does nothing yeah. <laughs> does that make sense nope, yeah i mean fair. it's entertaining to watch you know you're watching your freaking amphipods trying to go around on this freaking carousel it's like freaking, a uh, treadmill plat- for them <laughs> plat- <ball>. a hamster wheel. <laughs> yeah. but at the same time i don't want lean pods i want fat ones mm-hmm. um <laughs> i don't want them to be on the treadmill yeah well, um, that's fair <laughs> <laughs> So I think that it's more for aesthetics and for what what I would consider our benefit mm-hmm. and our viewing pleasure as opposed to a necessity. The the, um, only, the only other potential benefit of having a pump down there would just be less chance of detritus and stuff settling, which, I mean, that could just be pod food at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah, but mm-hmm. I mean, I I would rather clean my sump area mm-hmm. yep. that's dedicated for waste. Mm-hmm. than to have to clean my display tank all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons for the micro bubbles is not necessarily nutrient export. It's more nutrient transport to move it from the display tank to the sump where it does get exported, you know, mm-hmm. via the bacteria that consumes a lot of these detritus particles or, um, you know, dissolves a lot of the, um, I want to say the uneaten food and makes it bio- uh, bioavailable to, you know, the corals and the macroalgae by breaking it down into the dissolved nutrients in the water column. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, once again, it's not, gosh, it, it, it's not necessary to have it. it yeah. It's not necessary to have a hundred percent mechanical export, mm-hmm. um, you know, utilizing filter. Uh, filters, but the bacteria would actually carry a lot of that nutrients, a lot of the nitrates, the phosphates, and then it would get skimmed out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the reasons why it's called the protein fractionators, because bacteria is the protein. You know, it's a protein sac. Mm -hmm. And as it's absorbing a lot of the nutrients, you know, the nitrates, the phosphates, so on and so forth, Mm -hmm. that's what you're skimming out is the bacterial, you know, the bacterial colony that's, uh, you know, in the water column. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's what you're exporting. So, so with the mic, yeah, go ahead. Since we were talking about skimmers, uh, same thing with the, mm-hmm. the flow rate by them. Too much flow mm-hmm. versus slower flow, so it processes that wa- more of that water. Did you, mm-hmm. Do you think there's a benefit to having more dwell time in the skimmer chamber versus it flowing by? Or does it all work balance? Uh, That's kind of, kind of touched on uh, earlier. but Yeah, I would say just you know, moving more water around it, mm-hmm. being that it is a semi-closed loop, um, you know, once again, you're going to hit the majority of it, regardless of flow. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, there, there, there's a point of turnover where it now, you know, the dwell time is too long or there's not enough movement to where you could actually expose that, uh, that protein skimmer to all that water column. Mm-hmm. 
move, moving it faster doesn't change that. Yeah. Here's one for you then, Bev. So in terms of what you're saying there, dwell time and flow rate, okay, so what you're aiming for is creating efficiency within the skimmer, mm -hmm. being getting the, the skimmer to do its job to the best of its ability, and the job that we ask the skimmer to do is take out articulation from the water column, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So Perfect. there's two ways that you can do that. Yeah, so there's that sweet spot between sending the water at a fast enough rate so it's delivering the maximum yield of particulation that that skimmer can extract from the water. Yeah, mm -hmm. or the water being too fast where it it's it's not able to, to latch onto and take it out. That's, that's the issue, right? Mm -hmm. So to make that skimmer more efficient, what we could also do is enrich the water that it's taken in with particulation. Mm -hmm. So make the water uh, particulation dense rate higher. Now to do that, mm -hmm. you know, like at the bottom of your sum, you always have a, everything sell. Mm -hmm. So what you can do is get a, a pump and point it in the opposite direction of your, your, your flow in your sump. Mm -hmm. um, and what that will do is give an opposing flow rate mm -hmm. and then that will yeah. kick everything up and mm -hmm. prevent it from settling down. Therefore, you've got a higher density of particulation mm -hmm. in the water that the skin has taken in. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's called so the cross flow turbulence. More, yeah, cross flow turbulence. So it's taking more out, leaving less in the sump to deteriorate, decompose, and produce all your parameters. Because if it's settled, yeah. mm -hmm. it's not lead, unless you, you know, physically hoover it out, vacuum it out, it's not going anywhere. It's mm -hmm. decomposing. As soon as it settles at the base, you know, especially around the base of your baffles where there's low, that low flow area, it's going to start decomposing <coughs> straight away. It's, de it's into decomposition. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it won't mm -hmm. stop until you remove it. Mm -hmm. So if you create that cross flow, the uh, crews uh, named it like that cross flow, then basically you're kicking that crud up into the water column where the skimmer has an opportunity to take it away. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Anacoach is asking, has anyone had success without a skimmer? Like finding a balance that doesn't require taking too much? I, I have seen a lot of people will just use a giant refugium or turf scrubber rather than a skimmer. I yep. personally like both just because I think there's a lot of gas exchange benefit to the skimmer, especially because I don't have big waterfalls in my sump just because I like to keep it dead quiet. But I, I do think there's a lot of benefits to a skimmer. But yeah, I, there's definitely been tons I've seen with just either a big turf scrubber or like a really big refugium that can handle their export. Yeah, I mean, my thing with that is um, it depends on the system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's system specific. So, for example, do you need a skimmer on a tank that's small enough that you can completely manage that system by doing a cup, a cup full of water change every day? Mm -hmm. That the export of nutrients, the import of um, uh, mineralization, will will be dealt with by one cup of water every day being exchanged then why would you need a skimmer on that system why would you need chato mm -hmm. uh, or, or mm -hmm. keto on that system why would you need um, yeah. you know everything else you know filter socks and everything else mm -hmm. if you've got a small pico or nano size system and you're managing everything by just water exchange yeah you don't need it you don't need you don't need anything else right yeah. mm -hmm. you wouldn't Correct. need anything else the only, I mean, the only thing you you might want to look at with that method, though, is how how confident you are that by changing the water, one glass of water every day, that mm -hmm. what you need to be in that glass is going to be in the glass that you're changing out. Mm -hmm. What if the stuff settled on the sand, settled in the rock, wherever? Yeah. So, in that type of system, like a nano system, mm -hmm. what I mm -hmm. tend to recommend is an internal filter, an external hang on the back filter. And what that filter, like a sponge filter, mm -hmm. and what that sponge filter is for is not bacterial. Um, it simply is, a vac again, a vacuum cleaner. So what you're doing mm -hmm. once a week when you take that sponge out and rinse under the tap and squeeze it out, you're just exporting the mm -hmm. particulation mm -hmm. that it's being collected. And people will say, right. you can't do that because as soon as you rinse out under the tap, you're killing all the bacteria. But we're not using. But it's a mechanical filter. filter. Yeah. It's, yeah, a, it's mechanical only filter. for mechanical particle trap. Exactly, exactly. So you know, 
I would say with a skimmer, mm-hmm. um, I've seen people mm-hmm. just every system. It's like it's part of the system. Like in terms of, um, it, it has to have a skimmer on. Um, I, when I set up a new yeah. system. I I don't have a sim skimmer running for a good two to three months because mm-hmm. it's taken out what I want to be in the system to establish the, which is the, the bacteria uh, life. Exactly, bacteria. the life that yeah, the I want in there to create mm-hmm. that ecosystem. Correct. If I'm skimming it mm-hmm. away, what am I skimming away? There's there's not enough of it to mm-hmm. produce the nitrates and everything else that, that you're trying to get rid of. Okay, so, do more harm than so, good so that that is for nutrient export, but what about oxygen and gas exchange? Then you use other forms such as the bubbling method. Mm-hmm. So, and if you bubble, okay, so let's briefly talk about cycling okay mm-hmm. if you bubble a cycle your cycle is going to um, establish a lot quicker your bacteria is going to yeah. establish a lot quicker so if you can i have this debate a lot with um, the natural cycling people the old school people that say you know <sighs> crazy phrases like nothing good happens fast in a reef tank Mm -hmm. uh yeah you want the cycle to happen really fast why because the sooner your cycle happens fast as soon as your bacteria establishes and builds up the quicker you've got that ecosystem going that's then going to deal with everything else correct why would you want the cycle yeah why would you want your cycle to take three months (laughs) you don't want it to take Mm -hmm. three months but old school what we had to wait three months nowadays we don't so we mm-hmm. shouldn't, because the quicker we can establish the life system that mm-hmm. we want in our tanks, mm-hmm. the the more stable and supportive that system is going to be. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely, how that I mean, make sense to people. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's the whole point of bacterial seeding or u- utilizing mm-hmm. products such as uh, Live Rock Enhance. Um, you know, utilizing some of uh, Dr. Tim's uh, instant uh, instant uh, uh, what you call it the one and only bacteria or ATM colony, mm-hmm. you know, you're establishing a known form of bacteria and creating that bacterial film. So it can start processing the nitrates and the phosphates. Mm-hmm. And in order to do so, you have to ghost feed, um, uh, you know, get some of the nutrients back in. Well, you have to during the cycle. You're yeah. feeding the bacteria mm-hmm. essentially, right? So it, it keeps Correct. the population up. Yeah, no, I'm a huge fan of the whole bacteria in a bottle thing. It's just two wants to wait months when you don't have to. I'd rather spend 30 bucks on a bottle of bacteria and be ready to go in a couple of days. <laughs> well, we did it I, yep. um, in the old school ways. We used to do it. You used to go to your friend who had an established system and you used to get him to squeeze out his, his yeah. filter stuff for you. Yep. And then you used to pull and get, all, and and get all the mold. Yep. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's exactly the same thing, except it's been, you know, Bottled. developed and, and, and bottled properly. You know, that's the mm-hmm. only difference. If I can you imagine if I had these great big vats of bacteria infiltration and these big fat well-fed fish and all i did every weekend was squeeze the crud into these bottles and put a label on nick's uh, cycle juice and sold it for like five five dollars a bottle but it's the same thing it's what is it's only the same thing that we've been doing for years and years and years but then somebody produces it as a factory made product if you like all of a sudden it becomes chemicals and it becomes voodoo and it uh-huh. becomes unnatural. But uh-huh. it's what we've been doing for years. Well, you better start yeah. nickling. <laughs> better start boiling your well, next cycle juice. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is, is that, um, you know, the guys like um, uh, that invented microbe lift, they came from the wastewater water treatment facilities. Mm-hmm. Eat. One of those test tubes of that really, really, um, you know, once again, we we're talking about the lit, uh, the lytic type of bacteria that could actually digest par- uh, food particulates and, undi- you know, organics, undigested organics in, in, you know, that's exposed to high levels of oxygen. Those lytic bacteria <laughs> is a specific strain of bacteria that, uh, you know, that they've cultured. Mm-hmm. And one little test tube of that in the wastewater treatment facility is about $50,000 because it is one particular strain that was engineered mm-hmm. and bioengineered. Um, so what we pay for is a diluted version, of course, and we also pay for yeah, a, a couple of Im- impurities and a couple of other bacterial strains that may have made their way into those vats. 
So you're not talking about 100% pure form of, of any type of strain of bacteria. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the price, the price point becomes lower because the control and the quality control of that bacteria is a lot lower. So does that make sense? It does. Okay. So here's another side question. Is there mm-hmm. a big benefit to having one super targeted strain or is there more benefit to having a variety of strains that have the same general goal? Being that uh, <laughs> the, the re- <laughs> <laughs> being that it's a tank and we have multi uses for the bacteria, or you know, and I'm saying bacteria as a generalization, we're expecting it to do everything. Mm-hmm. So those multiple strains have different tasks. One's to digest and create that enzyme to be able to digest, you know, food particulates, undigested organics from fish waste. Mm-hmm. Then the other one is nitrogen binding. So you're talking about the nitrogen fixing bacteria, which is not the same as the digesting bacteria, which is one of the reasons why there's two different bottles with Dr. Tim's. Mm-hmm. There's waste away with the enzymes as well as the, uh, the macrophage bacteria. And then you have the one and only, which is an absorption type of bacteria mm-hmm. that doesn't eat food. It only absorbs the, I want to call it the dissolved nutrients. Mm-hmm. And those dissolved nutrients are what we skim out of the water column because they're typically waterborne. The digestive type of uh, bacteria are a little bit heavier. They're a little bit more robust. So they tend to sink and they eat a lot of the detritus at the bottom of the tank. Mm -hmm. And once they digest it, now that nutrient has become released into the water column for the one and only bacteria to be able to actually export it out of the system via the skimmer. Mm -hmm. That's the oversimplified version. (laughs) <laughs> all right <laughs> i'm interested to hear the technical version another day <laughs> oh, <that's true. laughs> not a problem uh just a quick heads up i'm probably going to call her quits in about 10 minutes just because i have another buddy over i gotta go do some running around in a bit uh Ooh, mm-hmm. oh, i know i gotta run to another lfs and pick up some stuff in a bit uh another oh, thing oh. on the flow side of it just throwing this mm-hmm. one out there semi-related but uh battery backup is i think a very important thing to have on at least a power header to in your tank since mm-hmm. flow is so vital if your power is out you know your tank can be without light it can be without heaters for a while but without flow for too long is when stuff will start to go downhill when you're starting to lose all that mm. oxygen and gas exchange in your tank so when... i got another one for you okay shoot <laughs> regarding that okay go what do you got what do you got for me well with the upwelling of uh the bubbles or the air stones and mm-hmm. stuff like that you also create current yep it's passive mm-hmm. current, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's pulling the bubbles, the larger bubbles are pulling up the water column. Once again, it's uh, the reverse of the billiards thing. Oh, it's drawing a vacuum, you know, behind it and causing an upwelling of the water. So you get natural turnover. And that's one of the reasons why um, during a power outage, I typically have air stones like lined up and ready to go mm-hmm. on my UPS and have those low powered uh, air pumps at least to be able to turn yeah. over the water now, and keep the you know keep the flow going. Now, if you are using a UPS as a battery backup, it's going to last a heck of a lot longer just using an air pump too than a, a actual pump. So, mm-hmm. other questions: Do you think there's more benefit to a bubbler or to a power head creating lots of waves and turbulence in the water? If you only had one, what do you think gives you more bang for your buck in a power outage? Bubbler. Well, okay, okay. It'll but then last again, longer, I'm partial. Better. Yeah, I'm partial to it. You're but at the same time, a diehard bubbler. If, I mean, if you take a look at the bait boxes that we have for fishing, mm-hmm. and you know, I'm an avid fisherman too, and I love fishing. The thing is that I don't see wave wave makers in my buckets. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, you have uh, you have those like little water pumps that shoot the water up and then has a sprinkler head on top. Yeah, that's good enough. But mm-hmm. the majority of it watt per watt and the energy that you're spending to actually drive it i find that the bubbler moves a lot more water a lot more efficiently yeah. because you're utilizing passive draw yeah um you know to actually turn over the water as well as oxygenating at the same time mm-hmm. due to uh, you know the contact time so on and so forth and depending on the size of the bubbles um so once again i am partial to the bubbler um that's one of the things in freshwater that's one of the things that we always had on backup was a battery powered bubbler. Mm-hmm. Um, regardless of, you know, 
how long the outage is, the bubbler always turns on in case of power outage. Yep, and they're um, they're inexpensive too. Even the battery operated ones, you can buy them for like twelve bucks, type fifteen dollars. Like it's it's good to at least have them kick it around for an extended power outage. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, is that um, you know, uh, you know, you go back to the efficiency of uh, you go mm-hmm. back to the efficiency of water movement. And you know, for the longest time, we had under gravel water filters and stuff like that. The UFGs. Um, under gravel filters and we've utilized you know basically power heads to drive them reverse power heads to actually push the water into the gravel Mm -hmm. or vice versa we put the power head on top you know like one of those maxi jets Um, the most efficient though going back to it is the bubbles because they want to rise so they'll draw the water passively and at the same time you're also increasing the oxygen without having to utilize any other mechanical means does that make sense yeah. Less less moving parts equals more reliability, mm-hmm. especially in the engineering world. Yeah. So the less moving parts, the, the better. better off you are. Nope. Very yep. very true. All right, guys. The one for me that'd be really interesting would be um, yes. as well as like rather than the battery backup would be like the scuba tank. Uh, <laughs> oh onto yeah. A, onto a airstone because that's going to give you like Ages. hours of, of yeah. oxygen rich air, and there's no mm-hmm. again you're not plugging in you're just, the bow. Off you go. True. Yep. Or, or you could actually hook it up to a solenoid, a reverse acting solenoid, so when the power yeah. is off, mm-hmm. it opens. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Very, very. So true. battery project, less, electricity less. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, guys. This is a good chat, but I need to cut her off today because I planned on waiting right, no an worries. hour. We're already an hour and fifteen. But I appreciate. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you both coming on. I do have to get you guys on more. I, I like these random conversations. They're good. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, well, sorry good. for the technical difficulties earlier on. Ah, no problem. Glad, glad to go to work out eventually. Yep. All right, guys. All right. Thank you, right. everyone Take who came on easy. today. Nick, Cruz, appreciate you both. Thanks for coming on. And I'll definitely have to get you guys in some more ones because we always get in some good chats. No worries. All, All right. right. Sounds All right. good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right. All right. You guys Bye. enjoyed it. As always, smash that like button if you're new. Subscribe. And I'll see you guys on next week's stream. <laughs>